In this section, we're going to start talking about the activating effects of sex hormones. And so we learned about the organizing effects, that they organize the genitals, they organize um, the brain, and um, that we have a second organizing effect during puberty, but most of the organizing effects happen early in life during prenatal development. But these activating effects, they can... Um, happen at any time in life. Uh, as you can see, sex hormones exert an activating effects to temporarily modify behavior. Behavior can also influence hormo hormone secretion. I think I'm going to put in like a, a little TED Talk video that talks about some behaviors that you can engage in to uh, raise your testosterone levels for a test or for a job interview. And if you have time, you can watch that TED Talk. But the two activating effects that we're going to talk about um, in this particular video, because I'm going to break it up for you because I know you guys hate it when I do long videos, is we're going to go through all of these activating effects. But I think this first video that we're doing right now is we're just going to focus on oxytocin, testosterone, and dopamine. And then the next ones we'll go over estriodol, vasopressin, serotonin, and prolactin. So let's get started with this cool oxytocin. I'm actually pretty excited about this particular video because I feel like this is stuff that is not taught. And um, I think that this could really help out people if it was taught a little bit more. So oxytocin is this hormone. Um, it's a really cool looking molecular structure. It's very large when you compare it to serotonin or dopamine. Um, but anyway, it, it's a really hot uh, hormone right now. There's so many studies on it, all the different things that it does. And your textbook goes over a few, but there, there's so much more to it. So I've added some stuff from other research that I have. Um, it's important for reproductive behavior. So um, what, what does that mean, it's important for reproductive behavior? So what we know is oxytocin stimulates uterine contractions during delivery, delivery and mammary glands in releasing milk. So also what an orgasm is for a woman is its uterine contractions. So it's very much involved in um, her sexual encounter. We're going to be watching videos about the orgasm in just a minute. Um, but Oxytocin is also known as the trust hormone or the bonding hormone, and it's released through trust, I mean through touch. Um, so uh, I teach a sexuality class, and so I've spent a lot of time researching a lot about the sexuality in order to make that class work well. And so I came across some research that found that the number one predictor of whether or not a woman has an orgasm um, early on in dating is whether or not she trusts her partner. And I thought that's so um, interesting in, as far as neuroscience goes is sometimes I have men that take that class and they say, oh, I'm going to take this class in order to be a better lover. And I say, oh, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't take the class for that. There's so many other things that we're going to learn about, like the history of sex and all these uh, different uh, why people rape and why they do this and why they do that. I can sum that one up in like two minutes. So don't take the class for that. Oh, yeah. Well, what's the two minutes? Well, uh, women need time and um, you need to make her trust her, trust you. So there's a joke that says uh, something to effect of uh, why do women fake orgasms? And the joke says because men fake foreplay. Well, that that's a silly joke. But anyway, look. This is something, um, I think it's estimated that only 30% of women can orgasm through penetration alone. That means 70% of women need uh, clitoral stimulation in some form. So I've also seen statistics that uh, women who experience uh, regular orgasms uh, during sexual encounters is around 17%. And the number of orgasms that men have compared to women is men tend to have three times as many orgasms through sexual encounters as women do. 
So I feel like this particular portion of the lecture needs to be directed at a little bit more if we're going to learn about um, orgasm that we need to focus a little bit more on women. So one major thing that promotes orgasm would be trust. So there we can see it because trust releases the oxytocin. They even have a spray that you can get that, and they use it in neuroscience, um, neuroscience uh, experiments. Um, I think they might have talked about it in the last section of the chapter uh, where it was social, um, social neuroscience. Um, so it's released through touch, and foreplay is a lot of touching. So we've got trust, released through touch, and then bonding. So what about this thing that men don't have uterus? So do men have oxytocin? Yes, as a matter of fact, they have double the amount of oxytocin receptors in their amygdala. And the research shows that men tend to fall in love faster. They tend to fall in love harder. And they also tend to uh, have more difficulty recovering from breakups. So men definitely um, bond to people. Uh, so what they find is, is they find that women, when you're younger, you need to think about this, is if a man causes you to have a really good orgasm, then he would release some pretty big oxytocin. The oxytocin circulates up into your brain and goes to your amygdala and causes you to bond because this is what happens when you have a baby too is the baby comes out, you have massive oxytocin flowing through your system and you bond to that baby that even though you've been through all that childbirth, you take one look at the baby and you say, oh, it's so beautiful. Oh my gosh, so wonderful. And you just want to stare at it for hours and just look at it because you can't, you've fallen so head over heels in love. And if anybody was to try to take your baby, you would be massively upset and, and fight to the death for that baby. And that's all probably the oxytocin. So when you're younger in your childbirth and years, you have to kind of be careful with this oxytocin because um, what it could do is it could cause you to bond to him. So maybe you say, oh, I'm just going to get mine. I'm just going to have like sex and I'm not going to get bonded. But unfortunately, your brain might be set up to get bonded through orgasm. Okay, so men don't have a uterus. So how do they get bonded? So they get bonded more through spending time. And so your textbook talks about that, that like behavior, that parental behavior can be um, influenced by uh, your behaviors. So they talk about, well, I'm not sure if I remember exactly if they talked about men in this particular version of the textbook, male rats. Uh, but in other ones, it could have been that they were just talking about a female without uh, babies. But I know in past editions, I've seen it, if it's not in this edition, where um, ma male rats will typically neglect the babies or even kill the babies. But what they did is they put male rat, um, uh, a glass wall between the male rat and the babies. And so he had to spend time with the babies in there. And eventually after him spending time with the babies for over a few days, his hormone levels had changed and he started taking care of the babies. So I know that uh, we can never like exactly say male, male humans and rats are the same, but I just wanted to show you that as an example is men tend to bond through doing things together and through spending time together. And so that's how they would release the oxytocin. Oh, here you go. Uh, here's a final little tidbit here. I know I spent a lot of time on this slide. The estimated average time for an orgasm in men is 2.5 minutes. In women, it's 12 minutes. So again, this is really uh, powerful for the males in my class to recognize that she needs to trust you, so you need to take your time with her and um, touch. She might need a lot of touch and uh, feeling bonded. This will all improve her chances of having uh, good sexual relations and an orgasm. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go on to uh, male sexual arousal because I have this great video that's going to tie in together the oxytocin, the dopamine. It doesn't really talk about the testosterone in this particular video, but we have a second video after that's a really funny one. It's um, 
an older video. It's actually the 90s, but I've searched and searched, and I can't find any other video that I love more than this testosterone video. So um, let I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a bit. Okay, so let's look at this testosterone. So testosterone seems to be a major hormone involved in the sex drive in both males and females. However, your textbook goes over how estriodol plays a role for women too. And we're going to, in our next segment, our next video, we're going to talk about estrogen and women's sexuality a little bit more as far as their menstrual period, which is super interesting. But anyway, we de definitely know that testosterone seems to play a major role in the sex drive. So sex hormones bind to the receptors in the hypothalamus, including the ventromedial nucleus and the medial preoptic area. Dang, we have learned so much about that hypothalamus for this, this uh, particular test. We got the lateral nucleus. We got the lateral preoptic nucleus. We got the paraventricular nucleus. We've got the medial preoptic nucleus, the interstitial nucleus. Oh, my goodness. Ah, it's so much to remember, huh? So anyway... This testosterone triggers the release in this medial preoptic nucleus. But again, just a sidelight so cool that how our hunger and our thirst and our temperature and our sex drive are all in the same area of the hypothalamus and how they connect to one another. It's so fascinating. So dopamine um, stimulation of the D1 and D5 receptors is associated with sexual arousal. So this facilitates it, okay? But then as these concentrations build, they lead to an orgasm. This would be the male. And in the last slide, we saw that men's sexual response cycle is so much faster than the woman's males. Don't forget that. Okay. Research on testosterone levels and sexual interest show a direct correlation. So the higher the testosterone, the higher the sexual interest. Uh, castration generally decreases sexual interest and in activity. None. Okay. Low testosterone is not the typical reason for impotence. So actually, if you took the sexuality class, we could talk to you about what it is. Is there's this enzyme that kind of traps the blood, traps the blood into the penis. And so what happens as men age is uh, this, they have lower levels of this enzyme, so the, the blood can't get trapped into the penis as well. Um, impotence is the number one cause of uh, sexual dysfunction. Um, and, uh, well, here, let's just talk about that. They've actually found that exercise, which re raises testosterone, can help with that. So that might be something you want to think about. Weight loss can also help with that. Um, testosterone levels correlate positively with sexual arousal and the drive to seek sexual partners. So I think the best date that you could possibly have as far as increasing the sex drive with someone is an exercise date where you go hiking or maybe you lift weights together or something like that. Married men or those in a committed relationship generally have lower levels of testosterone. They actually did a study where they put babies in men's arm and they tested their testosterone before and their testosterone after. And just males holding a baby could lower their testosterone levels. Like I said, as I have a TED Talk that I'm going to show you about how testosterone can change through so many things. Now I'm going to say something um, that's like a little scary little something is... Um, we're in the next, not this module, but in the next chapter, the chapter on emotions. Uh, we're actually going to look at how testosterone leads to aggressiveness. And they're going to talk about rapes and things. And we're going to find out that men with higher levels of testosterone are more likely to rape. So I'm speaking to a college course where um, you college women may be going to uh, campuses for your universities. And the research shows on rape that there's two groups of men that are more likely to engage in rape. And they kind of go with this whole testosterone thing. Do you know who they would be? Well, it has to do with this exercise and testosterone. Uh, so male athletes are more likely to rape and also males in fraternities. You know how I keep talking about that these are activating effects of the hormones? Well, what happens is, is when men get into competition, that raises their levels of testosterone. And when we're going to find out in the next chapter that when testosterone is flooding the brain, I kind of liken it to alcohol. It's similar. It makes it 
kind of shuts down your frontal lobe and it activates the uh, amygdala more. And so the two groups on campus that are more likely to rape you are the athletes and the fraternity brothers because fraternity brothers are all together and there's competition that goes there. So the reason why I'm going to show you this funny video, so I'm going to show you one incredible video right now that's going to bring together like the dopamine and the oxytocin. Oh, and it's going to talk about the orgasm. And a lot of times the orgasm, I believe the French word orgasm means little death. And this video is going to show you why it might be called the little death. Another thing that this next video is going to show you is it might show you why is there such fascination with Fifty Shades of Grey. So we're going to see this really cool two-minute video. So well done. I'm always so amazed at them. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you another video that's kind of older, but I love this one because it's males talking about how they feel about testosterone. And I took it from this video. It was called like something like Men Exposed or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was. But anyway, they had men all naked and they were talking about what all these different male issues and what it feels like to be male. So in this particular clip of the video, I don't think you see any penises, but you can definitely see that they're naked. But what I love about this clip that I'm going to show you is we're going to see actually a transgendered person, which is going to be, um, which we talked about before. And the transgendered person, he was a female and now he's a male and he's going to talk about how testosterone influences him. And I think it's so amazing to hear um a once was woman's perspective. She said, he says, having been a feminist, having been a woman, I want to tell you what testosterone does to me. So have fun with these. But perhaps the most curious and quintessential aspect of the human experience is the orgasm. The body's sexual response is typically broken down in four stages. Excitement, plateau of arousal, orgasm, and resolution. Following arousal, the brain stimulates blood flow to the genitals, your heartbeat and breathing increase, and the central nervous system is fully engaged, sending signals of enjoyment to the brain's reward system. These thousands of nerve endings constantly relay pleasure signals to the brain, resulting in an orgasm. For men, the orgasm includes rapid contractions of the anal sphincter, the prostate, and the muscles of the penis. In conjunction with ejaculation, which sees the release of sperm and other seminal fluid, the whole process for men involves around 3 to 10 seconds of intense pleasure. This is followed by a refractory period from minutes to hours in which another orgasm cannot be achieved. Women, on the other hand, do not experience a refractory period, allowing them to experience multiple consecutive orgasms. On average, these last around 20 seconds, though sometimes much longer, and consist of rhythmic contractions between the uterus, vagina, anus, and pelvic muscles. But it's the brain that takes control, or rather, lack thereof during orgasm. Using functional MRI scans, scientists are able to see brain activity in over 30 discrete regions. It's flooded with the anticipatory and feel-good chemical dopamine, which makes you crave the feeling again. This is in tandem with the release of oxytocin, a hormone that mediates bonding and love between mates. PET scans show, surprisingly, that brain activity during an orgasm is the same between men and women. In both genders, the lateral orbital frontal cortex is turned off, which controls self-evaluation, reasoning, and control. Makes sense, as you often lose control during orgasm. This shuts down fear and anxiety, which is seen as the most essential aspect leading up to orgasm. The relaxation of the amygdala and hippocampus in women further reduce emotions, producing a trance-like state, while in men it dampens aggressiveness. Many areas of a woman's brain are shut down completely during an orgasm. These effects are less striking in men, likely because of the shorter duration and difficulty with measuring during brain scan. In women, an area called the periaqueductal gray, or PAG, is activated, stimulating the flight or fight response, while the cortex, which is associated with pain, lights up suggesting that there is a connection between pain and pleasure. Following this climax and muscle contraction, the body experiences deep relaxation and heart rate slows to a resting pace. Who knew science could be so sexy? One big category is terms for weaponry. 
gun and pistol and sword and spear, uh, lance. You know, these go back a very long way and reflect man's interest in his own physical power and strength. And even some of the more modern jocular formations like Love Rocket or Heat Seeking Moisture Missile you know, still uphold this manly image of you know, someone who conquers and attacks and, and uses violence. When the cock takes over it, you know, it takes over what leaves your mouth. I mean, you say these things that you just know are not true. I mean, you're lying and you're doing it with such sincerity that you after start the fact, to believe it. You believe it and you scare yourself like Am I fucking crazy? I'm creating these alternate realities so I can get a blowjob. Yeah, exactly. I don't like Tony Bennett. Why did I say that? <laughs> Sometimes your hormones just, just grab you and you have this throbbing reminder of that's what you want to do and that's where you want to be. And I've actually had him uh, react, and we've totally disagreed, where like some 50-year-old waitress will bend over and I'll get a cleavage shot and he's up at attention. I'm like, you're out of your mind. No way. Come, are you serious? If I make a choice to, to um, cheat on my girlfriend, right, it's not because my dick made me do it. It's because I processed the decision and decided and it came to that, you know, fork in the road and said, I'm going to cheat, you know, and my dick had nothing to do with it. You know, I might have been aroused. I might have been excited. But ultimately, I, I was the one that said, I'm going to cheat. Having been female-bodied and having been a feminist and listening to all the rhetoric about, you know, men can control themselves and men can do this. Well, you know what? No. Testosterone is a really powerful, powerful hormone. And it causes certain physiological changes in bodies. You can't control the fact that you've got a raging heart on 24 hours a day. Um, that's just testosterone. If a guy feels like he is his penis, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it, it, that's part of what I am, is being penis, you know. There's times that I want to feel like I'm all penis, you know. And you do that. Guys feel like that when they're having sex. You feel like all you feel like is penis. So there's nothing wrong with it. Those are the good times, actually. When you're excited, it's like, it just feels so good. And you just feel like that's the center of the universe. And you feel like Superman. You're just like... Oh, do something, stick it somewhere. At a certain point, I realized I could hurt someone um, with, with myself if I wanted to do that. And at that point, you have to say, look, you know, either you want to be able to sleep with someone, sleep with a girl one time, and then she'll never sleep with you again, or you want to be able to sleep with her several times because you enjoy it, and she enjoys it, and she'll always want to do you again. If you go in there and hear somebody, they're not going to want to see you ever again. And, of course, I never want to develop my reputation as someone who hurts people because I can do that, and I choose not to. A lot of people my age weren't raised correctly. They were informed about sex correctly, so they had to go figure it out themselves. And I know a couple of girls who were in that position. And that got date raped and it fucked him up, you know, for a while. But, you know, it happens. I myself have never forced myself, but I've manipulated the situation. My early sexual experiences, I, I tried to assert myself with the penis. I, um, I tried to use it aggressively. The only reason I, I, I was using my penis that way was because, uh, because I was insecure about it. In a fraternity house, competition is... Competition is a bitch. It's a bitch. There's a, there's a lot of cock up there. A lot of, a lot cock. of cock. And then like, with cock. a lot of cock, there's a lot of cock blocking. You know? <laughs> when there's like two girls up there and there's 18 guys, you know. It's a lot of men on a mission. A lot of men on a mission. And, and your goal is to come out on top. You just go for the kill. She either going to like it or she ain't. So it's never You'll about, never see her again, so... so so you, matter to so you? you're never about satisfying a woman, is that what I'm saying? I'm always about satisfying Well, no, but a woman. you just said it doesn't matter, though. It doesn't. I don't believe in romance. So it's just, it's just uh, pound every time. It's all about the pound. Uh, grabbing the back of the head. That's the ultimate power trip, and just directing her head the entire time. Uh, that's power, but girls get pretty annoyed at that, too. <laughs> We're at our sexual peak, baby. I say, let it go. I'm young, dumb, and full of cum. <laughs> That's my thing. Very good. <laughs> I got a sexual drive, <laughs> baby. I tell you, just uh, like that, straight up. My libido is healthy. Don't worry oh, yeah. about that. <laughs>